Right? Most people think of Eventbrite as that consumer app of a place where I go and buy tickets. Uh, well, on the sales side, really what we're doing is we're going after uh, that high value, value inventory, which really is um, the interesting events that you actually want to go to, right? So that could be a Tribeca Film Festival, that could be a Tough Mudder, that could be uh, a beer festival. Bacon is huge right now. There's massive bacon festivals of 30,000 people. It's wild. Um, some of our largest accounts are uh, Santa Run, right? And, and it's um, what's interesting about it is a, is a Santa Run is a run by a Chicago City Council so the amount of deals we had to grease there just to get the account was interesting story in and of itself. But, um, you know, and, and I think that's what makes the, the sales side so interesting. Um, and I think it's also what makes it very challenging. Um, and it makes it very challenging from a sales side. It makes it very challenging from a marketing side because, as I just said, uh, a Tough Mudder individual and a Tribeca Film Festival individual are two very different individuals going after two very different markets, two very different buyers, two very different languages. And so how do we target both? And how do we do that in a very effective fashion? And so most, uh, especially in the Bay, uh, I think it's very much of a microcosm within the Bay. Um, you have a lot of these very high growth companies. And these high growth companies come in and say, hey, we need a sales team. I think you guys are kind of going through this right now. And we say, OK, um, let's, let's hire some young people. Let's hire some guns, um, is what you hear a lot. And, and let's just give them Google and say good luck. Uh, maybe we'll give them a value prop. Maybe we'll get someone in there to create a sales process, but then you go. Um, and really where I'm going to start talking about is Eventbrite did the same thing, right? They, hey, we need a bunch of salespeople. So they built this team of about 20 people uh, that were just going. They were Googling. They were doing whatever. And it was just kind of the wild west. Um, I entered in about two years ago. Uh, we went to marketing. We said, hey, we need some help. We've got to get out of Google. As much as we love Google, as much as we love clicking on the ads and making the money, um, we really want to create a very uh, you know, kind of strategic vision, a focus, um, and really segment the team, segment the marketing, and become much smarter in how we approach marketing. So um, that the, usually the next evolution is, is you go to marketing, right? And you say, hey, I need a bunch of leads. Um, and marketing says, oh shit, there's 20 of them. Okay. Um, and essentially what they start doing is they just start sourcing leads. The first thing you do is you buy lists. Um, you outsource to the Philippines or you, know, you do whatever you have to do to just flood the sales team with leads because you have this extreme unbalance of really supply versus demand, right? You have this massive demand and no supply. And this massive demand happens to be very loud, happens to be the squeakiest wheel, um, and really needs all this supply of leads. And so we thought, well, let's do that, right? And so marketing just started throwing a bunch of leads. It really looks like this. Um, and what this uh, is a picture of, if, if, if any of you have had the privilege of being able to tour FedEx's world headquarters, um, if you haven't and you get the opportunity, absolutely take it up. It's, it's a fascinating journey. It's a fascinating tour. Um, they were a client of mine in a past life. But um, this is a real picture of the FedEx facility. Um, and essentially what happens is at the exact same time, every single night, you have hundreds of airplanes coming in in all cross sections. There's no air traffic, uh, the guys on the, the bottom, right? There's just one tower and these planes are landing and they are offloading boxes and they'll turn over an entire 747 in 45 minutes. Where all those boxes go is right here. They just literally dump them on a massive conveyor and they say, all right, let's route them and go. And what you can't see, because the picture is dark and maybe not the best quality, is that there's humans right here. And these humans are literally as fast as they can, turning the boxes so the label's up and putting it on a conveyor belt. And then it's the automation takes place after there. Right? And so what we were doing and what was happening is we were marketing was actually doing a pretty good job finding all these leads and just dumping them on the conveyor belt. Where we fell short was, we had our sales managers who were then neck deep in boxes or leads, pulling at random, hoping for the best, and sending it to their sales reps, right? And it's because we had this extreme imbalance. And really what it led to was, unfortunately, there were no cool tech pictures of people frustrated, but um, you had very unorganized reps with very limited success. Um, you had very angry managers of... Hey, you know, I just gave you a bunch of leads. What did you do with them? I can see you never called them, or if you don't have a CRM yet, I hope you called them. You also have a very angry marketing team saying, hey, I'm giving you stuff. You keep asking for more, but I can't see that you're actually doing anything here. 
and it actually becomes this very contentious relationship. Um, and that's really what we had when I first came on board. And it was we had the Wild West, we had a slightly contentious relationship, and so you say, okay, let's let's try and find common ground here. Uh, let's figure out a better way of doing this. And usually, the first step that you take uh, when you get into doing this is you say, okay, well, let's maybe let's warm them up a little bit, right? You, you talk to the marketing guys and you say, hey, let's let's warm up these leads. And so I'm sure everyone's very familiar with this process. Um, you send out an email, you wait for the opens, and you call the opens, right? You prioritize the clicks. Hopefully, they weren't unsubscribed. Um, and and you go. And what this ends up leading to is still leads to very unorganized reps, very limited success, and it still leads to very angry managers. And so we looked at this, and we had this tool kind of stuffed in the corner called Marketo, um, you know, or a, a marketing automation software. And we had someone in the marketing team that kind of knew how to use it, but it was just there, and it was really there to send emails. Um, but really, Marketo doesn't send emails, so that was kind of weird. Um, and so we really looked at this lead, and we said, okay, this is, this is a huge opportunity for us, right? Our problem is, is A, we don't have these guys that are actually putting the boxes on the conveyor belts, and we don't have any of the conveyor belts. And so, you know, really what we did is we said, okay, let's, let's step back for a second, and let's really take a moment to say, okay, how should we set up these conveyor belts? What is our market? Um, what is our value prop? What does the market care about? What is the language that they say? And now how do we route these leads? Um, and a, a real guiding principle um, behind really what we decided to do from that point forward was I think you know it's very pretty common knowledge now whether you're willing to accept it or not. We we accepted it um, uh, with open arms, and it's this stat that came out by you know the corporate executive board and all the, the great research that they do. But essentially, seventy percent of the process, the sales process specifically, has already happened before we ever get to talk to them, right? And that's these individuals that are coming forward and they're saying, you know, um, hey, I've already done all my research. I've talked, I've, I've already looked at the five companies and everything that they have to do. I've been inundated with all the emails and done my own personal research. I just want a price. Give me the price. I know what the feature function I need. Sure, I'll go through your demo, whatever. Um, but ultimately, I, I need to, to, to just get a price. And it makes it very frustrating from the sales side. Um, from the marketing side, they use this, this opportunity, yes, yeah, so we get to control the conversation, which is exactly the right thing to do. I think many times, sometimes there's a miss of, well, or is the marketing team having the same conversation as the sales team? Is there a same guiding goal and principle? And so one of the first things we did is we worked with marketing uh, a lot um, and really ended up creating two different parts of the marketing group. We made a part of the marketing group that is core Eventbrite marketing, uh, consumer marketing, the organic traffic marketing, and then we made um, what probably you and I would call B2B marketing. Uh, in Ventbrite, it's called sales marketing, and they wanted to make it very specific. These are the marketing people for sales. Um, and we essentially, we aligned goals. So the marketing team is now covering your marketing, but basically compensated and gold based on sales goals. Uh, and uh, they are 100% accountable to the number. Uh, they're 100% accountable to the opportunities that they generate in the pipeline um, and the funnel that drives that, um, which uh, can, can be frustrating, you know, especially if you've never been managed that way. Um, they're not quite managed to like a, they're, they're on a, a commission model, like, you know, the, you know, within a sales model, but it's more of these are your goals now, these are your OKRs, these are your KPIs, um, and really um, it's a bottoms up approach of. Um, now here are the goals that we need to produce into the sales team. And so when we did that, we said, okay, we now know 70% of the conversations happening before we were making to a salesperson. Um, I'm sure as many of you are aware, you probably have the same uh, uh, opportunity. When you go to market, you actually approach market very differently. You talk to the market very differently. You have a very different value prop. You also have a very different way of how you solve the exact same problem in a rather old industry, right? And, and I think you see that a lot, with, especially with companies in the Bay. Um, with that challenge, knowing that 70% of the conversation happens uh, before it ever makes it to the sales team, we have to change the conversation before it makes it to the sales team, which made, made it very interesting. And so really, we, we set out to create a plan with really three core principles. Um, and it was drive the conversation you know, uh, early, Right? And so how can we insert ourselves into the market of 
um, getting these event organizers to stop thinking about feature function and really care about the value of what the platform is going to provide. It's always easiest to, to put out an email, to put out uh, a landing page on the new feature functions, right? On the new box office that we just released. That's this amazing, beautiful iPad app. Um, in the sales process, we never talk about it, right? Um, and a big part of it is, OK, well, what are we trying to accomplish with that? And then let's drive the conversation that way. Otherwise, people go straight into feature functions. Um, we had to set, segment the team, right? And really segment it on expertise. And so really, um, you know, set the, the SDRs, which I think we're all most common with, and then AEs. And I set out a, a fairly audacious goal of, I don't want a single AE ever working a lead. Never working a lead. And I want marketing to produce 100% of the closed one revenue that, we're per, that, that we end up winning at the end of the day, at the end of the quarter. And really what that means is marketing has to source everything as well as an AE never works a lead. And what that means is we have to optimize the SDR team to be able to take on a tremendous amount more opportunity to take a tremendous amount uh, uh, more work workload, um, as well as get the AEs then focused on purely nothing but the sales cycle from qualification all the way to close one, right? You know, you have your qualification, you have your discovery, your demo, your proposal, your close one. It's, it's a, it's, a, it's a very repeatable model. Um, but you know what we ended up doing, um, in order to maximize everyone um, and to get everyone in front of the right thing, we really had to automate and route leads based on that expertise. And so um, when we say we wanted the SDRs, the most common thing that people do is they then put up this team of SDRs. They get these fresh college grads. They found it on aftercollege.com. They got matched up. They said, yes, this is what I love. Um, and then they, they start and they start cold calling the exact same conveyor belt of leads. Well, that's insanely inefficient, right? Um, and so really, um, when we talk about that automation of leads, um, we really start creating, and when we contr take control of that conversation, um, is really elevating the thought and decision process. And so this is where we start coming into the concept of, and I'll probably spend a lot of time on this slide, and so at this slide, please feel free to ask questions, or, you know, raise your hand. Um, but, um, you know, the MQL, SQL, and AWP. Uh, the MQL is probably a very common term. Uh, the, the, the SQL um, may or may not be a common term. One term you are realizing that's missing for those of you that um, have talked to a marketing consultant or have talked to Marketo is you're missing SAL. Um, and SAL, I was very, very, very firm and very hard that we never had a, an SAL stage. And really, MQL is marketing qualified. SAL is a sales accepted lead. And then SQL is a sales qualified lead. And really, I wanted to get rid of SAL uh, because it was, it was my strong opinion that um, no sales rep ever gets to say, yes, I accept this lead. You have no choice. You are accepting the lead, right? You are trusting the system. You are trusting, you know, our marketing team is driving that conversation to a point to where it is qualified, right? Um, and it's being able to identify the part that's qualified can happen in that entire conversation. And so I don't, I didn't want to get into this spinning cycle of a, of a sales rep or a sales manager, which is very counterintuitive to many, uh, it, 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 uh, even early in my career, it's very counterintuitive to say, I, not all leads are created equal, which I agree. But there is an automated fashion to say, hey, actually, ones that make it to you are all created equal because we're doing a tremendous amount of work up front. So I didn't want a single rep saying, I do not accept this lead. And so I just got rid of that nomenclature. Any AE that's on our team has no clue of the concept of an SAL because everything that comes to them is an SQL. An SQL essentially is, is stuck with the, the SDR team. And then an op is where the AE starts and takes over, right? And so as I hit on a little bit earlier, um, in we have a Tribeca Film Festival and we have a Tough Mudder, uh, what we ended up doing through this entire process is uh, we segmented the organization into business units. And so now we have four business units um, that end up reporting into me, but it's four distinct business units that have a director. That director then owns the AEs and the AM, so the acquisition and renewal side. So, you, you eat what you kill from the director standpoint, so you better make sure you bring on the right customers. Um, but you know, from that standpoint, we now have these four distinct business units. And really why we, we, we landed on four 
uh, is because we have the endurance side, which speaks a very specific language. Uh, it's a very different uh, uh, way you speak about the product. Uh, it's a very different market. Uh, we have the music. Um, so that's you know your music promoters, your venues, your large-scale music festivals, um, your, your, your traditional festivals like your food and wine, your film, uh, and then conferences, so like your tech crunches or uh, your Google IOs. Um, and, and so they all speak very different language. Uh, what's funny is they all use the exact same platform, but they don't really know it, um, which, which makes it you know kind of fun, and which I think which is what makes Eventbrite so incredibly powerful. But creating these now vertical focuses, we've moved out of the Wild West. We've moved out of having these generalists of like, okay, I'm talking to an endurance race now. Okay, now I'm talking to a film festival. It becomes very awkward and very difficult for any individual to truly become a sales professional, right? And becoming a sales professional means you're an expert in market, you're an expert in competition, you're an expert in the value that your product brings and how your product can work in the different instances specific to who you're selling to, right? And so that became very important when we were working with marketing to say, okay, now we have four conveyor belts, right? We have all of our boxes coming in. We now have four conveyor belts that we need to start creating conversations, right? So when someone comes in, we immediately identify who they are, what they are, um, if they are an MQL. So from an MQL standpoint is, we now know what type of event it is, right? We now have some sort of contact information uh, and we know a general size of their event, right? Because the size becomes important, especially to us sales folks. Um, we only wanna work the big stuff. Um, but so we now know the size, and so this essentially becomes an MQL, a marketing qualified lead. Yes, this is someone that I'm worth, that's worth me spending time on having a conversation um, on one of these conveyor belts. Um, once we created that, we then created all these offshoots, right? So now it's that segment is then broken into, okay, what kind of content are they interacting with, right? And so then we have very specific strategies on the content, right? So is this a thought leadership? If they're only looking at thought leadership, they're not in a buy mode, I never want it to make it to my sales team. Just because they downloaded a, a white paper, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, just because they downloaded it doesn't mean I should call it immediately and hope for the best, right? That, what that leads to is a very frustrated sales rep, a very frustrated marketing professional, and you have, then you just keep creating that tension, right? And so we worked with marketing a lot. Uh, marketing put a lot on us to say, okay, well, you tell us what content to put out, right? What do they care about? What are the buying modes that you hear about, right? Um, and what are the language that they're speaking that, it, that, you, that indicates to you that they're not in a buy mode, right? And now let's create content specific to that to tease it out. So now each of these four conveyor belts suddenly had five, six, seven, eight other conveyor belts coming in off of it, uh, which became this, this fascinating way to just watch the flow of the leads. Now we're using this marketing automation tool um, that to its fullest potential, right? We're now putting in content. We're now identifying where they are in a buying mode or in a decision mode um, through content. We're having that conversation now. Um, and based on how they interact with it, they then, we then start routing it, and ultimately everything gets funneled into the SDR team. The AEs never have an opportunity to, to dip into the distro queue. The AEs never have an opportunity um, to pull from the hot leads that come in. It always goes to an SDR. And that's for a very specific reason, because I want the AEs focused on nothing but becoming a true sales professional within the sales cycle, right? Because the amount of prep work that you need to do, uh, the amount of discovery that you need to do, everything's won or lost in discovery. I think we can all agree with that. Um, the amount um, of follow-up that needs to happen and the thought that needs to go into a proposal is so vast and large, I really don't want them working leads. I don't want them wasting their time there. Not that it's a waste of time. I have a different expert that can focus on those leads. And so that SQL comes into the SDR team. That SQL number becomes a mission critical metric to marketing. And then the conversion of those SQLs into an op becomes very mission critical to marketing and to my lead of who, uh, of who runs all of the BDR team. So that's, those are the two numbers that I manage those two individuals to and ultimately to the opportunities that are created. Um, once it makes it to that opportunity section, um, we then have triggers that are based on time, right? So someone, an AE has to follow up with a, in this case now, a qualified lead coming out of an SQL uh, within a certain amount of time. Um, 
they weren't doing it. So we forced their hand a little bit. We set triggers that would set off red alarms. Um, uh, we, we, at one point, we created a trigger um, that would, if they didn't call it within 14 days of them getting the lead, the CEO got an email, and then there was an auto back of, what are you doing with this lead? Um, and it, was, it, it seemed something that was like, why would a CEO even care? But that was a revenue opportunity. And so we did that a couple times, and they realized, hey, maybe it's important that we call these. Um, but we got so, um, uh, we, we fine-tuned this so much um, that we ended up getting to a place where people were landing on our, our pricing page when they were searching, and we were calling them at the exact moment they were on the pricing page. And it was, hi, this is Melissa with Eventbrite, and we went, well, that's funny, I'm on your pricing page now. And it was this awkward moment of, oh, how serendipitous. I, well, uh, <laughs> what are your event needs? You know, and so then you kind of had to roll into it. So we actually got to this point where we had to throttle it back or delay a little bit, and so we started delaying by just minutes. Um, of, of when we release it because it was triggering a score based on the behaviors that they had been taking and the conveyor belts that they had went on. Um, and we were calling it at the exact moment when you actually do want to call it. They are in a buy mode and their, their probably next action was to pick up the phone and call um, or move on, right? And so that became a 50-50 shot if we were going to get it at that point. And we decided to capitalize on it and hey, let's call them and let's help make that decision. What really became the proof in the pudding, um, I put my entire career at Eventbrite on this process. Um, I put my neck on the line to really drive this. Uh, it was very painful. Um, it was a lot of contentious points with marketing. Um, but I think, I think when you're building anything, and you're building anything when the goals aren't necessarily aligned, it can become contentious sometimes. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, we have a phenomenal relationship with our marketing team now. Um, we work hand in hand. I've never seen uh, a level of collaboration between a sales and marketing team like we do at Eventbrite. I'm actually very proud of what we've built. And really the proof is really in the data. And so what you're looking at here is two lines, um, uh, trend lines, really the red one being revenue. I don't know why I chose red for revenue, that was stupid. Um, and then ops created basically the total opportunities or looks that we're getting um, from a, a finite number of, of course I took all the numbers out of it. Um, but what the, the important point is the trend line. And so really, it was Q1 2013 that we really started um, the ideation, the planning, the creation of everything. And really, it's here where we ban began building this engine. We call it the engine, right? And it's just this synonymous word that we call the engine, because that's really what it is. It's this engine of conveyor belts. Um, it's where all we're putting all the boxes on. We started building it in Q3. Um, you can see there's an immediate dip in revenue. That's a seasonality spike that you see um, you know, going on, but sometimes we get questions about that. Um, but we started testing. We started doing all these different little interactions. Um, AEs got frustrated with us at times, but we said, just trust me on this. Just trust me on this. Trust your partners. We will make this right. We will make this work. We will make it happen. And really, the goal was um, we wanted to kick it off in Q1 of 2014. We ended up uh, making it live and forcing it forward in Q4 of 2013, and we saw immediate impacts. I mean, it was it, it was night and day. From we flipped the switch and just leads started flowing beautifully. Um, SDRs were so incredibly busy. We had this SDR team that um, you know was kind of just stuffed in the corner. No one really. You know, it was like I I think I know what they do. They're just a new salesperson. They I think they just call leads. Sometimes I get what they do. I never really follow up on what they do. They weren't motivated, they weren't working great leads, and suddenly we started teeing them up leads at the right time, right? And then we used all of 2014 essentially to optimize, create more conveyor belts, create more content. We built out an entire event academy is what we call it, and really it's now becoming this destination for all these event organizers to come to, and now they're just giving us their information instead of us having to go out and scrape the internet, right, and find it or buy lists or whatever that may be of traditional methods, um, which becomes this just fantastic, um, you know, cycle within just an, a pure inside sales team and going through that growth. And so within a quarter time period, we saw this massive growth. And then over the year, we just saw tremendous success and continued success, which I think was really the important piece. And so as we go into 2015, we, we're very confident in what we're doing, right? We're very confident 
um, in how we're going to achieve the metrics that we need to. And so I listed out some of the core metrics uh, we had to, uh, you know, to, to what we accomplished within the sales team specifically. Um, obviously, these are sales metrics, but the, the lion's share, I would say 70% of the credit goes to marketing, right? Because they were teeing this up at the exact right time. And so really, from an AE efficiency standpoint, we increased our conversion rate by 30%. That's huge, right? Um, the next thing you look at is, okay, well, we increased our conversion rate, but we were working the same amount of leads. Actually, we increased our conversion rate, and we were working the double amount of opportunities per AE, which was just fascinating. Um, what was great is the bookings increased. Uh, we reduced the sales cycle by 30%, and so before, it would take longer than a quarter for us to close anything. So anything new that came to our pipeline, we couldn't count on it in that quarter, so if we were short in a quarter, uh, we had to get really, really creative, right? Um, and now that we've condensed it to the close within a quarter, we now have stronger control of our quarter at any point in time. Um, and uh, one that I, I missed here um, uh, was the average deal size, right? Um, that's a, an incredibly important metric as you move forward and you start automating because when, uh, one of the most uh, natural uh, feelings that you get as a salesperson is what comes from marketing A is cold um, and it's all small. Yes, you do get a higher volume of small deals, but that's because you're getting a higher volume of deals and that's just the virtue of the world, right? How many large enterprises are there compared to small businesses? There's 20 million small businesses. There's 500 Fortune 500s, if I'm counting correctly, right? And so if you just think of that imbalance of just the market in general, obviously you're gonna be working more smaller leads. Um, but what was important about that metric is our average order size, actually uh, it ticked up by just a, a couple basis points, um, but it remained the same. Uh, which was the best part about it. So we were working, yes, we were working more smaller deals, but we were also working the same amount of more larger deals, um, which became fascinating. From a BDR standpoint, we increased their opportunity production by 275%, and we increased the revenue contribution of what they were producing into the team by 10x, right? Um, and we had to produce by 10x because they really weren't producing much, right? They were working all the cold leads that no one would ever want to follow up on once they produced an opportunity. Um, and now I have AEs coming to me all the time. I have them going to the BDR team all the time saying, so uh, when's, the, uh, when's the next opportunity coming by, right? Um, which, if that's the case, then you're missing on a proposal or you're missing on follow-up or you're missing on some sort of research that you need to be doing on your prospect or your opportunity. But um, it's now turned into this, this beautiful cycle of where we have AEs that are hungry, we've doubled their output, and they still want more. We have AEs that are crushing their goals. We actually had to increase goals quite a bit because we were they were crushing them so much it, became, it, it almost became too easy, right? We accelerated the lead production and the opportunity production so fast, and they were closing so fast. Um, we ended up you know, increasing goals and, and they crushed those as well, which is fascinating. And so now we're at this beautiful time in our organization to where um, when we go into a planning uh, phase, you know, at the end of the year. So my favorite time of year um, is when we're in, uh, you know, New Year planning. Uh, but um, our business is now insanely predictable. When I say insanely predictable, I know once an MQL enters the stage, I know exactly how long it's going to be there. I know the conversion of those MQLs at any point in time uh, into an SQL. I know how long it stays in an SQL stage, and I know the exact conversion going from an SQL to an op. And I know exactly how long it takes for an op to get to close one and what the close rate is on that. Um, and that becomes fascinating, and that becomes a very powerful tool for me, from my standpoint as a, as a, as a business leader and a business operator and a sales lead, um, and really being able to predict my business, and then know what levers I can tweak. Um, and that is when sales and marketing really become true partners, because now we're looking at the levers, and we're saying, now how can we optimize this together, right? Of course, it's not a harmonious relationship at all times. There's still you know, disagreements, but it's now a healthy debate. It's now a healthy disagreement if it is there, but we're all on the same page. And so this year, I couldn't have been more proud of the team in that when we went through the planning phase, uh, there was literally a marketing person and a salesperson that were shoulder to shoulder for two solid months, and they built out their plans together. They built out uh, their 2015 annual plan. They built out the Q1 plan to support that. We'll go into Q2 here in a month or so. But um, now, suddenly, they're in it together, 
and it's no longer I have this idea, well I have this idea, let's let's arm wrestle and figure out who wins. It's now this is our idea. And so what's funny is um, you know, we'll have the quarterly reviews and I'll ask questions that are directed to the marketing person for this specific business unit. And it's my sales lead that's that's answering it and defending them almost, right? Um, but that, you know, it, and I think that's what makes the relationship so great. And I think that's what makes this model work so well. Um, of course, it didn't come without its road bumps. Of course, it didn't come out, come without its, you know, difficult conversations. Um, and from, especially from the sales side, a hell of a lot of trust um, that our marketing team was going to produce, um, you know, what we set out to do. There were some points where we, we weren't sure. Um, and I think there were a lot of points where the marketing team wasn't sure if we would actually follow through and say, yes, don't worry, every AE will follow up with what you, you know, or every SDR will follow up with what you send. Um, but we are now doing it. We all believe it. And we've been able to you know, share that success with the entire team that um, it's actually become uh, this, this fascinating, um, I, I think, case study of just building out an integrated sales and marketing team um, and really scaling that out. Um, and that's really what I had for today. And there's a, a lot of me talking on the journey, but I'm at Eventbrite specifically. But I'd love to open it up to any questions. If, if we have questions, exactly right. right. Okay, if you want to open up any questions. I think that's so, aside from the sales page, what other material was your sales marketing team creating to separate the funnel between people in the discovery mode and people who are actually ready to buy? Yeah, so there was, uh, it, whenever we create any type of content now, it's we're creating content that's uh, it's, it's a thought leadership content. Uh, it is a specific a buy mode content. So we'll create a case study that's very specific to someone wanting to learn how to do something, wanting to learn how to implement something, right? That may indicate someone who's now thinking about, is there a better way of doing something, right? Um, would be an example. A thought leadership would be, hey, we have tons and tons of data, you know, hear about what attendees care about, right? Or what they're saying on social media. Um, and then that just it becomes more of a thought leadership uh, uh, standpoint. What other questions? You mentioned uh, verticalizing. Yeah. Um, sort of what you know. If there's a rule of thumb of how many, how large of a team you need to start verticalizing. Like, you know, how, how uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, if the team's too small, you don't know if it's the market or the rep, right? Um, and so uh, twenty was really kind of our magic number, and we had about four reps per vertical. That gave us a lot of room and flexibility to be able to test things. Uh, that also was able to identify a, uh, a true top performer, right? Um, and what we should be aspiring the entire team to and to upscale to. Um, that's what we found uh, uh, to work for us. But they're, I mean, they're vastly different markets, right? Our, our music team is uh, a field team. You know, they're in market uh, versus our, our, our registration team, which is calling SMBs, you know, at medium, medium sized, large enterprises, they're used to getting a phone call, so it's primarily in sales. And, and, those, and those four team of, teams of four? Yeah. So those four people, how many are SDRs, how many is AE? Uh, I, I have SDRs as a separate team that's not within a vertical. So then they, they become a service. Um, most organizations, the most common rule of thumb is uh, you have three or four SDRs to one AE, and then you have generally have um, some sort of combo of uh, one to one relationship of AE to AM. Uh, we've become so efficient that we're actually uh, backwards in that ratio of SDR to AE. We actually have one SDR to every two AEs because that SDR is producing so much hot opportunity, which, mm -hmm. which, is, which is really neat, right? You need that four to one ratio because they're calling all cold, but we're now at a one to two ratio now. Wow, that's powerful. So yeah. um, you indicated the, the, the sort of one of the fundamental building blocks to this was the split in marketing between sort of the brand marketing and consumer marketing group and Sorry. sales marketing. Yeah. Um, sales marketing, does that report to you or does that report still to marketing? No, I have a counterpart in the marketing team. Okay. Um, and then we work hand in hand. And then uh, the marketing team is also segmented into those four major verticals. Um, and then they work hand in hand uh, with their business partner, their the director of the so which, what's interesting about that that seems compelling to me is, is sort of you've taken what's often a really significant friction point in cross-functional uh, effectiveness, right? Mm -hmm. And you sort of solve for that by putting 
you know, sort of the same objectives in two yeah. camps. Yeah. So you, and yeah. I assume you built a really strong relationship with that person, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, it was a very, you know, there were points, you know, I think everyone, you know, goes through this within their, their career at, at some point, as you're, especially as you're, you're growing up in it, is um, should marketing report to, and sales report to the same person? It works in some organizations. Uh, you get the, the, the mind of it shouldn't, uh, primarily because I really have no clue how to set up a trade show booth and what are all the promotions and campaigns that need to happen within a trade show. That is not my expertise, nor do I want it to be my expertise. Um, and there are some very, very powerful people that know how to do that and do a phenomenal job with the ideas and the creativity that they come up with that. Um, and so there was something where we said that there really are is two expertises. And so can we get the right personalities and individuals to be able to work together? So this is just taking a peek into the, into the next one, but I'll ask you. So are you now at a stage where on the enterprise side, mm -hmm. you've begun to identify either field sales reps or people that travel to the really large customers. Talk briefly about that. Yeah, yeah. So from, uh, it, it, it also really depends on how the market interacts, right? So from the music perspective, it's insanely relationship driven, right? It's about who you know. Um, from, a, from, a sales, uh, from a sales standpoint, I, I like to think I can break through that. Um, I've also learned I'm not cool enough to be in the music realm, uh, but um, it is very relationship driven. So we have guys in market, you know, they're taking them out to dinner and they're going to shows with them and, and they're speaking to speak and they're speaking the language. Um, the relationship there is, is slightly different in that uh, marketing is now teeing up content to the same <coughs> audience, very music specific, but we're empowering, that model's a little bit different where we're empowering the AE with understanding that knowledge with the relationships that they have, right? So what are they doing outside of the conversation that we're having, and which becomes very powerful. Um, and then we have some that are a bit of a hybrid. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yes. One. Here. You mentioned um, moving the leads to an MQL to an SQL. Yeah. And you mentioned one of those kind of passive indicators being uh, a view on the pricing page. Yeah. And then you mentioned some of the content pieces. Mm -hmm. um, Wondering if there were kind of one or two kind of hacks that you found. You, all these leads, you probably ran a lot of experiments. But anything that really stood out other than the pricing page within all those content pieces that really was a high indicator of got to move this MQL to an SQL. Yeah. Was, yeah. So, so the, the, the question was um, there was this phase, there's a stage between that transitions from an MQL to an SQL. And what was the content or what, what were the actions that determined what triggered to an SQL because they were truly in a buy mode, right? Um, versus the example I gave, which was the most obvious, they're on the pricing page. Um, and, you know, if you, if you think about it from the perspective of if they're searching for things that are how do I, right? How do I blank, um, you know, or implementation type of uh, questions from a sales perspective, uh, you, you know, when the prospect starts asking about implementation or how this would work inside their organization, that immediately becomes a buy signal. And so then how can we create content and pull that forward um, in that relationship of how are they finding um, and looking for those implementation or how would this work in my, my organization? Okay, very good. Uh, Tim, I think I... Just a little bit presentation context. What is the, like, the average deal size um, what you guys have? I mean, how much does it vary between the, the, the different verticals? Um, because I'm being filmed, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll give you size of events, maybe uh, in terms of number of attendees. Uh, so it's very different from BU to BU. Um, but you know, so on the conferences side, I would say the average is probably um, around. Uh, I want to say about 1,500 attendees and doing translations in my head. About 1,500 attendees. On the music side, I would say the average would be probably around uh, 20,000 attendees, right? Um, you know, from the largest to the smallest. Um, the festival side, probably uh, a little bit lower than that. Um, the endurance side, there's a lot of race series. So you could have someone that has, uh, you, know, uh, you know, close to you know, millions versus, you know, thousands throughout the year. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.